Have another mic? Okay. Well, welcome. Hello. Welcome to the House Committee on uh, Special Legislative um, <coughs> Affairs. And I'm on the wrong page here. Um, the date is March 8th, and I'll have the roll call. Tony, when you have a moment. Here. Grace Diaz. First Vice Chair. No. Uh, second Vice Chair Bernard Hawkins. Here. Representative Karen Alzade. Here. Representative Samuel Azanaro. Here. Representative Stephen Casey. Representative Barbara Ann Fenton Fong. Present. Representative Joshua J. Giraldo. Present. Representative Brianna E. Henrys. Representative Catherine Kazarian. Present. Representative Rebecca Kislak. Present. Rebecca, uh, Representative John J. Lombardi. Present. Representative Ramon A. Perez. Representative Justin Price. Representative Deborah Ruggiero. Okay. Present. We do have a quorum, Chair. Mr. Bolantonio, could you please record me present? Okay. Rep. Diaz. I, I have you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, now we will, uh, I will hand it over to my vice chair to hold for further study. Madam Chair, I'd like to hold the following bills to, for further study. H5415, H5592. H5593, H5594, H5926, H6045, and H5781. Thank you very much. Do I have a second? Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. May we have a roll call on holding the votes for further studies? Those votes? Those bills, excuse me. Yes? First Vice Chair Grace Diaz. First Vice Chair Grace Diaz. Yes. <laughs> Second Vice yes. Chair. Yes. Second Vice Chair Bernard Hawkins. Yes. Representative Karen Alzate. Yes. Representative Samuel Azanaro. Representative Stephen Casey. Representative Barbara Ann Fenton Fong. Yes. Representative Joshua Giraldo. Yes. Representative Brianna Enries? Yes. Representative Catherine Kazarian? Yes. Representative Rebecca Kislak? Yes. Representative John J. Lombardi? Yes. Representative Ramon Perez? Representative Justin Price? And Representative Deborah Ruggiero? Yes. 11 in favor, zero against. Thank you, Tony. Madam Chair, I'd like to move the following solemnization of marriage bills, H5952, S74, and S266. Is there a second? Second. Second by Representative Kislak and <coughs> Representative Lombardi. May we have a roll call vote on those uh, bills for solemnization of marriages, please? Chairwoman Fogarty? Yes. First Vice Chair Grace Diaz? Yes. Second Vice Chair Bernard Hawkins. Yes. Representative Karen Alzate. Yes. Representative Samuel Azanaro. Yes. Representative Stephen Casey. Representative Barbara Ann Fenton Fong. Yes. Representative Joshua J. Giraldo. Yes. Representative Bri Brianna E. Henrys. Yes. Representative Catherine S. Kazarian. Yes. Representative Rebecca Kislak? Yes. Representative John J. Lombardi? Yes. Representative Ramon A. Perez? Representative Justin Price? Representative Deborah Ruggiero? Yes. The vote 11 in favor, zero against. Thank you very much. Okay, those bills will move on to the, the, the floor for the consent agenda. 
Um, next, we will start with our hearings, and we are going to have Representative Williams, um, who is going to testify on her bill, House Number 6045, an act relating to holidays and days of special observances. Representative Williams, the floor is yours. Or Chairwoman Williams, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. House Bill 6045, this act would eliminate the state holiday of Victory Day and replace it with the state holiday of Emancipation Day to be held on the first Monday in August. We are the only state in the country that still celebrates the day that countless lives were snuffed out in an instant. The Japanese are now long-term allies of our country, and it is inappropriate to continue to celebrate this day that remains so infamous to them. Instead, we should be celebrating life and hope with our state holidays, not death and domination. It is for these reasons that I propose this change to Emancipation Day. What better day to celebrate than the moment when so many enslaved black people in this country became free and full citizens? They were, sorry, this cord back here has got me kind of, citizens of this country they were very instrumental in building. We should be celebrating the victory of life overcoming unspeakable odds, not the victory of death and destruction. I received several phone calls. No, strike that. I received several emails regarding some World War II veterans. And this is my response to not only them, but to this committee, just to hear where I am also coming from. First of all to them, thank you for your service to our country. Growing up in a military family, I know the sacrifices that are made in order to serve, to serve, mm, order to serve and you have my utmost appreciation and gratitude. I would like to explain my intent for introducing 6045 and to assure you that my reasoning for introducing this legislation is in no way, shape, or form a disrespectful attack on our country's veterans. My grandfather, father, and several uncles all proudly served our country and because of this, all veterans have my lifelong respect. I also currently have family members who are actively serving and my support for them and our troops are unwavering. Without their honor, courage, and sacrifices, our country would be a much different place today and I suspect it would not be for the better. That being said, I also do not believe it is appropriate to continue to celebrate the demise of other human beings, especially those that are now considered close allies to our country. There is a reason we are the only state in the country who continues to celebrate this holiday, and I believe it is time that Rhode Island joins the rest of the states and retires this problematic holiday that truly is offensive to so many. I agree with you that our World War II veterans and their families should be respected, celebrated, and honored. What they all accomplished for our country and the world can never be repaired, repaid, but we are currently witnessing in our society when it comes to words the devil is in the details, and the name and origin behind this holiday is troublesome. We should be celebrating these dedicated souls 
by redirecting our attention to the humanity and trump and not the inhumanity of war, death, and destruction. Their devotion to freedom and the sacrifices that were made should not be forgotten, nor should they remain uncelebrated. Yet, I do believe it is time to move on from this holiday that everyone else has long walked away from and replace it with something better, something more unifying, and something every American can proudly stand up for and celebrate. With that, Madam Chair, members of the committee, I am open for any questions, are if there, any, there are any. Oh, are there any questions for Chairwoman Williams? Representative Kislak. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank you, Chairwoman Williams, for introducing this legislation. And I think you summarized very well about why it's time to move past celebrating Victory Day and move on to celebrating the freedom and emancipation of enslaved people here in Rhode Island. So thank you very much for your leadership on this. Thank you for your support. Are there any other questions for Chairwoman Williams? Hearing none, we will go to the phones. Oh, I'm sorry, I did not see you, my apologies. Um, so, Representative um, Azanaro. Thank you, you Madam Chair. You know, I have no problem with uh, giving ourselves another holiday in the state of Rhode Island. But to take away Victory Day, to me, is a slap in the face to all of the veterans in the state of Rhode Island and in the state in this great country of ours. Uh, it, it's a day that was tragic. Uh, people that were in World War II, Korean War, all remember what a dreadful day it was in December 1977. Uh, I don't want to blame anybody for war. war. War is not good for anyone, but the veterans always say, we never forget. We never forget all the lives that were lost in the United States, all, all of our boys that lost their lives in World War II. So take away that day. I don't care what the other states in, in this country do. I really don't care. Rhode Island has always celebrated this day, and I want it to be continued to be celebrated as a victory day. And as I said in the beginning, I have no, no, no qualms about another day, Emancipation Day, let it be any other day of the year. That's fine with me. But don't take away the day that our veterans uh, look for. Thank you. Can I? Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman, uh, Chairman Azanaro. Um, Representative Williams. Um, thank you, Representative Azanaro, and I respect your opinion and feelings. But it's a, it's a situation where, as you know, or maybe not, but many people of color do, um, requesting an additional day for celebrating people of color will probably come another 400, from, 400 years from now when everybody's talking about unity and love and let's do it together and diversity. This is not in any way looking to take away memories of what these veterans did. It's definitely appreciated and it can continue to be talked about. But celebrating the demise of a people, remember, the demise of slavery in this state of Rhode Island, for which have been importing more slaves than the other places in the country, is definitely, definitely something to think about. So just because you feel and believe and others feel and believe that you know, Rhode Island has been celebrating it for years and it needs to continue, does that mean that it's right? We should not be celebrating the demise of any people, any culture at all. Celebrate something, celebrating is something about joyous times. I know that we, 
as a country defeated the enemy, but those enemies in that time were defeated. We're here now living amongst each other, working with each other, so it should be a celebration. It should not be what you may be perceived, you and others may be perceived, that we're eliminating what you all accomplished in any way. Like I said, I have family in the military currently. So my family definitely fought in the war as well. So with that, I have to say, it's time for us to let go of all the hate because the majority of the time, people don't even know what VJ means. They just are looking forward to the day off. At least this will be a reason to celebrate and the perfect day to do that is to swap with VJ Day, not eliminate the history of it, just to swap it. Thank you. Okay. Madam, Madam yes. Chair, yes. if I may. Representative Azanaro, and then we'll move on to yes. the next speaker. Yep. I, I will, you know, I will support another day as Emancipation Day because we don't want to forget that either. But I don't want, it, once you take that day away in time, that will, that will all be forgotten, and it should never be forgotten. And Emancipation Day of Free and Slavery should never be forgotten. So I, I'm with you on, on that day, any day you want, but don't take away a day that veterans uh, not maybe look forward to, but can remember why that day is so important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I think that we also saw a hand up from um, the screen could change. Was Representative Vella Wilkinson on there? Yes, okay. Uh, Representative Thank Vella you. Wilkinson. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. I have a question for um, Chairwoman Williams, if she'll take it. Will you take it? Yes, I will. Okay. Thank you, Chairwoman Williams. I've got, uh, first of all, I have a statement and then I have a question for you. It's a misnomer to say that veterans celebrate Victory Day. It's a day of commemoration. It's not a day of celebration. I mean, we have no control if the general public decides to use it as a, as a time off or to go on to sail or to go to the beach or anything of that nature. But it, it, it's a day of commemoration, just like 9-11 is a day of commemoration. We certainly don't celebrate 9-11. We commemorate it, though. We do it with, uh, with ceremonies that are very solemn, and we're remembering those who perished during 9-11. I understand what your intent is. I respect your intent, and I appreciate the fact that you articulated it. My question to you is, is there a reason why you specifically did not go for Juneteenth, which is, my understanding, Emancipation Day? and why you specifically went for the day that Victory Day is celebrated, or, or commemorated, I should say. Okay, Juneteenth, I would just respectfully ask you to do a little history. Um, Juneteenth and Emancipation Day are two different distinct things. Um, so therefore, to utilize Juneteenth as the freedom celebration, it was not, it does not fit because it doesn't so, represent the two. The two yes, are not the, end the of same. Slavery? I'm sorry, I, I, that's my ignorance. I, I've always thought that Juneteenth was the day uh, that slavery had ended, so that's my mistake and I apologize for that. Okay. Could you uh, explain the difference between the two? Keith Stokes is going to be on here and he'll give you the whole cake and ice cream with regards to the two, seeing that he is online waiting to make a, a, a more in-depth presentation, and that question can be directed to him. Okay. Um, but I applaud you saying it's a commemoration. You can continue to do that. It's, it shouldn't hamper anyone doing that, and that will be my answer. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Are there any other representatives that are on uh, right. virtually? Oh, oh, John Lombardi, hi, how are you? <laughs> the floor is yours, sir. Very good. So, now, very quickly, and this is a, uh, the, the chair may not have the answer for this, meaning chair, Chairperson Williams, is there a requirement 
do we need some kind of a legislative uh, uh, okay from the federal government to do this? And it's just a question again. This is a complete naivete on my part. Uh, is there a federal requirement in order to get this done so we can't supersede federal law? And again, just it's a question. No, it's a state holiday. It's not a federal holiday. No, I understand that. My question is, does it require no. some kind of okay from the federal government? That's my question. I said no. Okay. Yeah. Do you know that? Is but, that for sure? Do you want me to get it for you? I'll give it to you. I'll, I'll no, email no, I'm it asking, to you. I'm asking you. I'll email asking. it to you, darling. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. Again, I can't see everybody on the screen right now, so is there anybody else who has it from home, from virtually? There we go. Okay, the screen has popped back up for me. Is there anybody else at home who has any, or virtually has a question? No? Oh, we do have one here, Representative Fenton Fung. Uh, Representative Williams, Chairwoman Williams, thank you so much for bringing this up. Is there any other state that celebrates Emancipation Day? And if so, do you know what day they sell it on, celebrate it's it on? It's the first. Monday in August. It's August 1st. So, and there are other states that celebrate it, you know, so we're trying to make sure that we, as part of that celebration. Great. I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So now we, since there are no other questions from here or virtually from the reps, we will go to our first caller, Emil Sipola. Emil. Hello. Hi. Uh, hi. How are you? It's uh, Kathy Fogarty from the House Committee on Special Legislation. We are waiting for your testimony. Okay. My name is Emil Sapolo. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Representative Abney is probably in the room, isn't he? No, he's not here. He's not part of this committee. Okay. Well, I've testified several times before Representative Abney and the uh, Veterans Affairs and, F and Finance Committees of the House and Senate. And I, uh, I've always been objective and analytical. But in this instance, I'm somewhat emotional in my opposition to H6045. One, it's disrespectful to the thousands of Marines and Navy personnel who served in the Pacific. It was bad enough to change the, the name of VJ Day to Victory Day. Uh, but now it's somewhat personal. I had three uncles who served in the Pacific, one of whom was a prisoner of war of the Japanese, and I think it's obscene and disgraceful to and disrespectful to all those student uh, ser servicemen. Excuse me. So, if there's committee feels there's some need to have an emancipation day. I would suggest they include it with Martin Luther King Day in March rather than Victory Day in April and August. Any questions? Any questions for Mr. Cipolla? Okay. Hearing none? No, thank you very much for your testimony. Well, oh. One other statement. I think I represent the Southern New England chapter of MOA, military organization, and we're. Uh, we're also opposed to that. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for your uh, your um, testimony, and also representing Moa. We appreciate your time. Thank you, sir. Bye. Goodbye. Next, we have Kaylin Polly. Kaylin. Yes. Hello. Um, you have the floor here at the House Committee of Special Leg on Special Legislation on House Bill six zero four five. Hi, okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Kaylin Polly. Um, I am a constituent of Senator Anderson and Representative Bennett, a member of District 31's Democratic Senate Committee and a community organizer. Um, I'm here uh, testifying today because Victory Day is another way that Asian Americans are routinely othered and written out of the American narrative. Uh, recently, since the pandemic started, Asian Americans have experienced increased racism and hate crimes, um, and there is a lot of systemic change we need to create regarding how Japanese Americans and Asian Americans are treated in the U.S., but changing the state holiday name is a simple step we can make right now. Um, so I urge you to consider this legislation and support it moving forward. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Any questions for Caitlin? No, hearing none, Kaylin, we appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Next up, we have Keith Stokes. 
Mr. Stokes, are you there? Yes. Oh, how are you this evening? Good. All right. You are going to testify on House Bill 6045. All right. Um, I'm not in front of a TV. Is that okay? That's fine. No, we can't see Good. you anyways. That's okay. We Good. can hear you. That's great. So you go right ahead. All right. Can I begin? Yes. Yes, please do. Great. Uh, my name is Keith Stokes, uh, Newport, Rhode Island resident, and I'd like to testify on behalf of uh, House Bill 6045. Uh, please accept my strong support for this bill to eliminate the state holiday of Victory Day and insert in place as a state holiday, Emancipation Day, to be held on the first Monday in August. The earliest celebrations of Emancipation Day date back to when slavery was finally abolished throughout the British Empire by the Slavery Abolition Act, which came into effect August 1st, 1834. Since then, each year on August 1st, major Emancipation Day celebrations were organized across the West Indies and America, and particularly in American cities, including Providence and Newport, Rhode Island. Emancipation Day festivities starting as early as 1850 in Rhode Island were well attended with thousands of people celebrating at Roger Williams Park and Crescent Park. Victory Day is a legal state holiday only in the state of Rhode Island. Every other state continues to honor and remember the valiant contributions of our armed service citizens through Memorial Day, Veterans Day, and the 4th of July. Changing Victory Day to Emancipation Day does not diminish the memory of our veterans, but enables all citizens of Rhode Island to come together and celebrate America's highest values of personal freedom and liberty. In closing, my own ancestors have served honorably within armed services in nearly every American conflict dating back to the American Revolution. My own Newport uncle, Alfred Stewart Barclay, died in service to his home and country during World War II as a member of the Tuskegee Army Air Corps. His sacrifice was made on behalf of all citizens, regardless of race, ethnicity, and religion. Making Emancipation Day an official state holiday will be a fitting tribute to his memory and all others who value liberty and freedom in Rhode Island. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Stokes. Are there any questions for Mr. Stokes? No? Okay, thank you again for your time and your testimony. Um, that's it for our um, callers calling in. We did have one letter from a John Gallo who was um, against... Um, the bill 6045. And with that, I will close the hearing on House Bill 6045. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. This act would create an elected and appointed minority official commission to create a record of elected and appointed minority officials from the inception of the state as a settlement in 1636 by Roger Williams to the present. The purpose of the commission shall be to establish a permanent record of state and municipal elected and appointed minority officials holding executive legislative or judicial office. The record shall state the name, position, and period of elected or appointed services each minority official. The commission will be made up of 13 members with three co-chairs. The commission shall have unrestricted access to the state archives to complete its work and shall establish rules and procedures for any person to petition the commission to amend the record of elected and appointed minority officials to include an additional elected and appointed minority official as a proper individual for inclusion in the record. This commission will help shine a light on what was and is possible for the community of color and it is important that this information is available to inspire future generations to achieve greatness. Thank you. Are there any questions for Chairwoman Williams on House Bill 5781? 
Seeing none, we will go to the Thank uh, you. call and testimony. We have Thomas Avila, who is pro House Bill 5781. Mr. Avila, are you there? Yes, Thomas. I am here. Okay, you have the floor here at the House Committee on Special Legislation. You may begin your testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, I, I am speaking on behalf of this bill because I've been doing uh, research regarding the minority community elected officials for the past 25 years. I've been collecting information about it, and I have uh, gathered uh, sizable uh, documentation about it. But uh, what, I, what it drove me to actually uh, support this legislation was that uh, the last couple of years, back in 2019, I actually decided that I wanted to expand on the information that I had gathered. And I went to the uh, library at the State House and requested information regarding minorities. And um, they gave me actually the run on initially, well, we don't have it. And I said, well, how, how, how is it that you don't have it when, you know, you've been collecting it for all these years? And I said, well, is there any way that I can get that information? And what they said to me was, the only way you can get it is if you come here to the uh, office and we give you the annual reports that we do for elected officials and you can scan them. And I said, that's it? So yes, that's the only way you can. So I took myself to the um, a library and I sat there for about an hour going through every book and finding the minority elected officials and scanning them and then when I finished, I collected the information and I added it to my, to my report. Uh, but then I proceeded and went to the, um, called the, uh, the Providence Archive. And I asked for the same information and I got the same results. So my concern became that, uh, you know, as far as uh, I can recall, uh, the first uh, African-American elected official was, uh, I think, 1845, 1847, and there was some information about him. You know, uh, I was able to get that information through other sources, but then anybody else who was elected after that, I actually have to dig really deep and why to get that information. So it is... Uh, in my opinion, it is about time that there is a centralized place where the next generation and the generation uh, present can go to one central place and find information about all minority elected officials, just like it can be found about other individuals you know, across the state. So that's why I'm speaking on behalf of this bill. I feel that it's necessary. I feel that it's time to have uh, you know, a commission a form to look into it and actually create a centralized database, a centralized information that can be easily accessible for everyone else. And that is my testimony on behalf of this bill. Thank you, Mr. Villa. Is there any question? Oh, Representative Azal, okay. So I just, oh, it's loud. Um, so I'm in strong support of this bill. Um, I handed over to you a small book about the Black and Latino Caucus. Um, and as many of you know, I am the chair of the caucus for this, two, for, for this term. Something that um, I always look for Thomas Avila for any information that we need when, uh, we, when I need something uh, about our elected officials. And, you know, being the... Um, Representative Williams, we talk, when we talk about her, we talk about her being one of the first, one of the first women of color in our chambers. But only we just talk about it. It's not, it's not anywhere that somebody can come and look it up. Somebody years from now can come and look it up. And so I'm in strong support of this because we need something for our people. The reality is there's gonna be many, many of us up here one day. Um, mo I mean, right now there's, um, it's the biggest that we've ever had, it's 21, 21 people between the House and the Senate. That's huge for us, and we need a place where our history can, can be held and where we can continue to tell our stories. So um, thank you, uh, Representative Williams, for this bill. It's, I'm in 100% uh, 
uh, supportive of this and you know there's so much so much to tell and so much that needs to be told for for um, you know for us to learn about our own history but for generations after us so thank you exactly and thank you uh, Rep. so that book that book that I sent uh, is uh, my latest project and, it, and it's exactly what you mentioned because uh, this year is a historic uh, period in the legislation for the first time, there's 21 elected minority officials. Um, in, it's the largest in history. And I feel also that it's just the beginning of what is going to be happening. Uh, everything, every demographics out there that I have read and I, I have available, it says the same thing. Uh, you know, pretty much the prediction is that uh, by um, 2043, uh, Rhode Island is going to be about 40% minorities because it's the fastest growing demographic. And if that is the case, if that's the prediction that is out there, then it, this is the time that we need to start uh, do, uh, doing something like this uh, bill proposes. So again, so that when that time comes, we don't start from scratch. Okay, thank you. And uh, Representative Chairwoman Williams is back up at the podium. I, I would like to just add Dr. that um, it was disheartening when I too was looking for information through the Secretary of State's office and the library um, that they didn't have any information. And um, I hear that, and then I got a call today saying that cities and towns keep their own record, you know, but realistically, they certainly are not keeping a record of. Uh, elected officials or appointed officials of color. That would, I would believe, would be something that would be here in the Secretary of State's office and as well as in our library. Because the first person of color goes back to 1865, I think it was. And that, in fact, is Mr. Uh, former Representative Van Horn, who is, in fact, a descendant um, family of Keith Stokes. And you don't see his portrait in here, the first and only for that long. There's no information in the Secretary of State's office. There's no information in, in the library with regards to him. So it's time. We go back a long way. So I think it would be advantageous for that history to be right here in hand to be able to have it. Thank you, Representative Williams. Representative uh, Fenton Fung. Um, Chairwoman Williams, I can't thank you enough for doing this. Being married to someone who is the first Asian American almost everything in this state. Um, I have gotten, after we got married, to understand how important this is for the next generation to see themselves in these roles. Uh, we were on a fundraiser last night and seeing different Asian Americans, whether it be at the municipal level, state level, federal level, whatnot, it has inspired a next crew to get civically involved, get active. This isn't just, I might run one day. This is, I'm going to be on a board. I'm going to be on a commission. I would love to see the library's um, record of this to include visual um, document and what everybody looks like. I think that's really important for them to see themselves in government. Um, I think it's also very interesting as women have been elected over the last century too, and we all take our husband's names and whatnot and how that might play, you know, if we don't keep an accurate record, who knows who thinks what 100 years from now. So I couldn't support this more. I thank you so much for bringing it up. And Tomas, if you're still on, thank you for all the yeah. work you have done over the past years. You really have been doing this yourself, per se. Yeah. And you're an, an inspiration to so many in the minority communities and an inspiration to many in Providence. So thank you so much for all you do as well. You're quite welcome. And it is, uh, as you mentioned, it is uh, uh, about, you know, seeing ourselves in, in uh, you know in different facets and in particular so since I started this the way I described it is uh, when I first uh, started this 25 years ago I was dealing with uh, my uh, people my age baby boomers since then Millennials have come along and generation C's are right behind them so there's been two other generations since I started 25 years ago and very much is like they still do they still doing it the same way I do? I've been doing it by myself, one by one, and I feel that that needs to be changed. So it's been my pleasure to do it, and uh, I'm glad. And I thank uh, thank you, Rep. Williams, because uh, we had this conversation last October. I share my experience with you. You shared uh, that, uh, that that we had a similar experience, 
And now I'm so happy to be testifying, but most importantly, I'm so happy that this legislation is actually a, a being part in, of being heard and hopefully being approved. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, I just want to say thank you also to Chairwoman Williams and to uh, Tomas for uh, really pushing this and, 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 and making it a reality. Uh, I'm, looking, I'm sitting here looking through some documents that have been provided about uh, historical figures in, in the minority community that have um, had their own share of, of, of struggles and, and, and uh, victory over the past, you know, 200 years, and it's and it's really uh, it's really beautiful. It's inspiring, um, and it, it it gives me a sense of responsibility uh, to continue some of the work that, that that they were doing. So I just want to say thank you again uh, to to Chairwoman Williams for sponsoring this and pushing it forward. And I'm really happy to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you again for allowing me to speak on House Bill 5781, which would establish an elected and appointed minority officials commission. As a person of color and the youngest Latino to ever serve on any state legislature, this is a personal bill because as a government institution, we cannot underestimate the value and importance of racial representation. All too often, our black and brown children see former President Barack Obama as the only political figure they can identify with given that he is the only prominent politician who shares an identity similar to theirs. Now, while we have had a history of diverse representation across our state in all levels of government, from school committees to city councils to state representatives to our Secretary of State, it is difficult to access this information. This is why it is important we invest in a bill like this, as it would create a commission focused on establishing a permanent record on elected and appointed officials of color, tracing back to the state's original, original settlement of 1636. Most importantly, the findings of this commission would be an invaluable resource for our public schools, colleges, local media outlets, museums, and public libraries. Together, we can pass this bill and be proud of the diverse history we are paving for the next generation of leaders. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Morales. And now we'll go to the phone now for Anita Bruno. Anita, are you there? Anita Bruno? Oh, wait a minute. Huh? Anita? Anita? Do we have a connection? Okay. Well, Anita Bruno from the Rhode Island Woman in Trades was pro this bill. Um, if she calls back, if we get a hold of her. Oh, you got her. Okay. Be there. Anita? Anita? Anita Bruno. Hello? How are you, Anita? How are you? I'm Kathy Fogarty from the House Committee on Special Legislation. Um, the floor is yours on House Bill 5781. Hi, thank you, Ms. Fogarty. Thank you for the time of listening. Um, I wanted to testify that I'm in some of House Bill 578 uh, Minority Committee and representing, I think it gives our state a great way to celebrate all of our minority elected officials, which we haven't been able to do in the past. And it's a good way to document the history going forward so all the future generations can see the achievements of our minority elected officials and hope, therefore, one day, if you see that, you can become that. So this will also give our young minority individuals an opportunity uh, to see the celebration of and know that they too can reach for that, for those goals also. Well, thank you very much. Any questions for Anita? Nope, seeing none. Anita, thank you for your testimony. I appreciate it. 
Okay, and with that, I think that closes House Bill 5781. Thank you. Next, we have Representative Cordovan, who is here with her House Bill. Wait a minute. House Bill 5415, an act relating to state affairs and government state emblems. Representative Cordovan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Fogarty and committee members. Thanks for hanging in there. I know for some of us, we've been in this room for a while. Um, <laughs> tonight, I'm honored to uh, move this bill forward to make the, to advocate for making the state coral a state emblem. And this little coral is one of the few corals, I think the only coral that grows in Rhode Island. I never knew that we had any corals. I grew up in Miami. There were coral reefs all over the place. But Roger Williams University is studying this coral. And this was brought to my attention by a constituent of mine, who, Dr. Cody Sharp, who I'm sure we'll hear from on the line. And in the wet lab at Roger Williams, they are uh, researching how to help the corals down in the southern climates that are dying off from acidification. And, but this coral that we have up in Rhode Island is much more hardy, so it provides um, an opportunity that this coral can survive through all kinds of things that are knocking off the, killing the other corals. That should be more appropriate. Um, so uh, I would, with that, I'd, I would move that we would go to the floor uh, to, or to the phones. Um, if uh, the, What this would do is really um, highlight, give the university, uh, and not give us an opportunity to highlight the work going on at the University of, of Roger Williams. So I think it's an opportunity to showcase um, some very creative work that's going on right, in there, our state. Are there any questions for Representative Cordofran while she's here? If not, I will go to the phones and look for uh, Dr. Cody Sharp from Roger Williams University. I do remember her children. Creative work. Yeah, you did this. Um, hello, um, Dr. Sharp. Hi. Hi, yes. You just turn us down in the background there. And uh, you have the floor, and you did an excellent job last year. I remember about your corals, and then I think we went on COVID break. So if you could inform us again about this wonderful Northern Star coral, we'd appreciate it. Sure, thank you. Uh, and, and thanks for uh, hearing us tonight on this on this issue. Um, I am uh, Dr. Cody Sharp. I'm a marine biologist at, at Roger Williams University. I'm also a Rhode Islander. I'm here to give my strongest support for this bill uh, to make the Northern Star Coral the official state coral of Rhode Island. Um, and as Representative Corcoran said, granting this coral as a, a state emblem designation is an opportunity to celebrate the coral as a unique asset to the state of Rhode Island. Um, not only as an emblem for research that's being done in Rhode Island, but also to enable conservation and education for Rhode Islanders. And not to mention, it gives us the chance to, to set the standard for such programming in other states across the country. Um, it, this coral is uh, the only hard coral present in New England. Yes, we have coral living here in New England. Um, many people are surprised to hear that, as, as Representative Corcoran said. Um, oftentimes when people think of corals, they picture tropical reefs. Um, but Estrangia is, uh, while it is a coral like those in the tropics, it's uh, different in, in a few very key uh, key ways. So it, its name is Estrangia. You could say it's strange. Unlike its tropical cousins, um, it's New England tough. So it's a hardy coral. It can withstand our extremely cold winters, our super hot summers. Uh, like Rhode Island itself, this coral is small. So Representative Corcoran held up a, a piece of coral that's in fact uh, one colony. So it's not like these large boulders or the branching corals of the Caribbean, um, but it's these little tiny colonies that exist in about the size of a silver dollar. It's more flexible than its tropical cousins. So its tropical cousins maintain partnerships with microscopic algae that live inside of the tissues and when that partnership is disturbed in tropical corals, the algae are lost, and that's what we call coral bleaching. Bleaching can kill corals, and it's currently devastating reefs worldwide. This is due to climate change and ocean warming. Estrangia, our coral, doesn't need this partnership to survive. It engages in it, but it doesn't rely on it. 
Um, and because that partnership is so flexible, we can use it uh, as a model in the laboratory to learn more about how, uh, how bleaching happens and to pinpoint detailed mechanisms that, for example, cause disease in corals. Um, it has a really unusually large range in the U.S. Uh, it extends all the way from the Gulf of Mexico up to Buzzards Bay. Um, but the science of this coral, importantly, is deeply rooted here in the state of Rhode Island. Much of the science that has been done on Estrangia has been done by Rhode Island researchers, including the first known description of it by a, a famous naturalist, uh, Louis Agassiz, in, in Castle Hill here in Newport. Um, and I have uh, worked to co-found a large active collaborative of researchers from all across the country who have recently become engaged in studying this unique coral. And the momentum in Estrangia research is building at a really important time, a big moment for our oceans. And so here in Rhode Island, the ocean state, it just seems straightforward to name an official state coral um, and to set the, the standard for this, particularly one uh, for this coral that is so unique. It's very much like Rhode Island and Rhode Islanders. It's small, it's hardy, and it's full of insights for solving global problems. Um, so I, I think not only would it honor our current academic innovation by Rhode Island researchers, uh, I'd like to think this could enable new education and outreach efforts like K-12 through curriculum where school children could learn about Estrangia, they connect with local ecosystems, this provides a portal to global climate issues. Um, and so I thank you for considering this, the passage of uh, the official designation for the Northern Star Coral. Thank you. Dr. Sharp, thank you very much for your testimony. I like how you describe it. Are there any questions for Dr. Sharp? <laughs> oh, Representative Fenton Fung. I, I have to admit, when I saw this come up on the calendar, I, I was thrown by it a little bit. I didn't realize this had been heard last year, yeah. so I didn't get to know all about the corals. Um, is there any other state out there that has an official state coral? Great question. I was wondering the same thing. And as far as I can tell, there are no other state corals in the U.S. Hawaii does have um, a state gemstone, which is black coral. Um, so this positions us to be the first state that has a state coral where we're focused on um, a, a coral that represents an emblem for conservation and for research, which is it's really great. Yeah, I like, I like the angle that you take on that for sure. And this is the only coral here in Rhode Island, correct? Yes, it is. Okay, well then why not? All right, thank yeah. you so much. I agree. <laughs> I, li I like it. All right. Um, so thank you again, Dr. Schott, for your testimony. And thank you. We're going to move on now to Ionis Myolus. I probably did that name terribly, but my apologies. Oh, yes, President Myolus. Yes. Uh, you have the floor here at the Health House Committee on Special Legislation. Okay. Is it the go right now? Yes, go right ahead, go right ahead. Okay, terrific. Good night, uh, good evening, everybody. And as president of Roger Williams University and a Rhode Islander, I'm here to give testimony in support of making the Northern Star Coral the official state coral of Rhode Island. The naming of a state coral is an opportunity and a tangible statement on our ocean state to show its dedication to our vital ocean and coastal environment. You just heard uh, Cody, one of our uh, great faculty members, share her great work. She has been leading research into this interesting coral for many years now, along with colleagues uh, at the University of Rhode Island. Uh, as the former president and director of the Boston Museum of Science, I played a key role in getting STEM into K-12 schools, and, uh, and students love the ocean. And, and, uh, and our efforts in this area and recognition can be a great way to introduce them to the sciences and raise awareness of the issues and opportunities in our local ecosystems and climate and ocean literacy. And now, more than ever, scientists are looking to non-tropical corals as models so that we may learn all we can in order to conserve and protect our quickly disappearing and treasured uh, natural resources. And Roger Williams University is committed to being a leader in coastal resiliency and research, and our local coral is a critical aspect for our academic research agenda and for our efforts toward protecting uh, our oceans. Please join me in supporting the passage of official state designation of the Northern State Coral, and thank you so much. Well, thank you, President Morales. We appreciate your um, testimony. Are there any questions for the President? 
No, hearing none, thank you again for your testimony. And with that, I will close the hearing on House Bill 5415. Next, we will move on to, I was looking for Representative Price. I thought I saw his name up there to try to get his votes, but I think he has left the, the um, virtual. Okay, well, maybe he'll come back. If you hear us, if you uh, hear me, uh, Representative Price, we need to get your votes on holding the bills for further study and uh, the bills that we moved out to the floor. Uh, next, we will have Representative Tansy um, come up, and she is doing, change the page here, House Bill 5654, an act relating to General Assembly naming state constructions to the E. Richard Durfee Road. Representative Tansy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairwoman Fogarty. I appreciate the opportunity to present this bill to you all tonight. Um, and it's about a Nar long-time Narragansett resident um, who passed away and um, we're looking for a way to honor the work that he's done and all that he's given to the community. So this bill would rename a very small portion um, of a road in Narragansett uh, that is adjacent to the restaurant um, that Mr. Durfee um, ran. It was a, a family, multi-generation family restaurant. So we're looking to name this the E. Richard Durfee Road. Um, and it's funny because when we first proposed doing this, um, most of these roads are named, you know, insert the name and then way. And his family said that he was such a humble person that it felt awkward for them to have the word way um, after his name. And so they requested that it actually be called road. Um, so Mr. Durfee was 71 years old and lived a very rich life when he passed away. Um, he graduated from high school in South Kingstown and enlisted immediately in the U.S. Army. He served in West Berlin um, for many years, and then when he finished his time serving our nation, he returned to Rhode Island, his beloved Rhode Island, and enrolled at the University of Rhode Island. Um, he attended the College of Business and then went to work for Raytheon as an accountant for many years. And when his dad said that it was time for him to retire, he called his son and asked if he would be interested in taking over the family business. And he had long expected it and very excitedly took over. Um, Richard was so involved in the community. He was a charter member of the Narragansett Lions Club. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the Narragansett Lions Club, um, it is the largest Lions Club in the entire world. So he was a founding charter member of that. Um, those of you who are big into to, um, baseball at the university, or excuse me, basketball at the University of Rhode Island, he was very involved um, in that team and helped to recruit many of the, um, the best and favored uh, players over the years at the URI team. Um, he began the Blessing of the Fleet. For those of you who like to come down and spend time in Narragansett, we have a huge festival each year called the Blessing of the Fleet, and he was the founding member of that. Um, he um, went on to serve you know, endlessly within the community, but it was really the generosity of his heart that uh, impressed us in the town of Narragansett and for which he will be long remembered. Anytime anyone needed anything, they knew that they could count on Richard, and he delivered. He was always there for his community, whether it be volunteering, um, to be a coach for a small baseball team, um, or donating um, you know, the restaurant for an evening for a fundraiser. He was always there, um, longtime fixture in the town of Galilee. So this bill um, would rename that portion that's adjacent to the family restaurant, George's of Galilee, and I would really appreciate the support of the committee to make that happen. We do have, um, this bill came up rather quickly, so I wasn't able to um, have the family here to testify. Um, and we do have a resolution coming from the town of Narragansett. They have that on their next committee agenda. So um, I will be sending in written testimony from the family and uh, the resolution from the town of Narragansett when that passes, as I expect it will, because it has in the past. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Representative Tansy. Are there any questions to uh, Representative Tansy? I know that the Durfee, and I know the Durfee family, I, I vaguely recall Mr. Durfee. Um, myself, I know his son, 
Um, but the restaurant of George's, he was, like she said, was it's been a tradition in Narragansett, and he was always there for the community down there, and I think it's a beautiful way to honor um, what he's done for that community. Really a great guy. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No, hearing none, I will close the testimony on House Bill 55, excuse me, 5654. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will have House Bill 5926 by Representative Chairwoman Vella Wilkinson. And this is a act relating to holidays and days of special observance, a day of special observance uh, for 12th for Women's Veterans Day. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I just want to start off by giving you a little, a little background on this particular holiday. June 12th, actually June 12th of 2018, marked the 70th anniversary of the Women's Armed Services Integration Act. It was a law that was signed by President Harry Truman on June 12th, 1948. It enabled women to serve as permanent regular members of the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, and Air Force. And the federal calendar designated June 12th as Women Veterans Day in, uh, in 2018 to mark the 70th anniversary of the law. In, if you look at the numbers with regards to uh, women who have served, right now 20% of new recruits are women. 18% are on the act. Excuse me. 15% are active duty. 18% serve in the guard and in the reserve forces. 280,000 women have been sent to Iraq and Afghanistan. 44% were enlisted. 13% were officers all of which were deploy, deployed two or more times to both those um, theaters. The purpose of having a, a Women's Veterans Day is to acknowledge the contributions that women have made as veterans, and it's also part of the VA healthcare systems campaign entitled I Am Not Invisible. It's a way of bringing awareness of women veterans in the community to the general public. Now, I, uh, right now, in my research, I found that there are 15 states that currently celebrate a Women Veterans Day. It does not take away from Veterans Day. And in fact, it doesn't take any, any, any more than having the Navy birthday, the Army, the Marine Corps, the Air Force birthday, having those days separate would take away from an Armed Forces Day or a Vietnam Veterans Day. It's just another way to bring awareness to the contributions of women veterans within the state of Rhode Island. And having the holiday, it's a holiday in observation. It would not cost anything. It would not be a paid holiday. It would just be a day that was specifically set aside where we would, like we do for Women's History Month, where we would acknowledge the contributions of women veterans within our communities. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, are there any questions for Representative Bella, Wil Chairwoman Bella Wilkinson? No, there are none, but I think it's a very good bill and I think it's a great way to recognize women in the military service. I appreciate you bringing that forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Hearing none, I'll close the testimony on House Bill 5926, but don't go anywhere, Chairwoman Bella Wilkinson. You have another bill in front of us, House Bill 5592, and this is an act relating to holidays and days of special observance for first responders. Representative Chairwoman Bella Wilkinson, the floor is yours again. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, House Bill 5592 was originally brought to my attention by a constituent who lives in District 21 who has been um, on a letter writing campaign throughout the nation asking for a holiday and observation for um, the, the sacrifices, <coughs> excuse me, that our first responders make for us. There's an emergency and they're the ones that, that immediately run to the emergency to help us to provide service, to provide um, any um, emergency needs for the person's physical condition and so forth. And the date of March 17th, originally when I had initiated this bill, 
I had looked at October 28th because then it would be in line with the federal holiday. And when this bill was heard, I think it was two years ago in committee, uh, a question was brought up of why we're doing it the same day as the federal holiday and can we get some feedback from the Chiefs and, uh, and, um, Association so that they could look at the members themselves in police and fire and the EMT and ask what would be an appropriate day. And it was reported back to me that they, the, the preferred date for them was on March 17th. I don't have any skin in the game in terms of the day. As I said, the federal holiday for um, First Responders Day is October 28th. If the committee decides that they want to go forward and commemorate a day that would officially thank first responders, I'm open to whatever day you feel is appropriate. Thank you. Okay. I see that there's a question by Representative Fenton Fung. Uh, Chairwoman, thank you uh, so much. I, I'm glad you kind of brought up my point before I did. Um, March 17th is a really interesting date. So I, I don't know if there's any testimony coming in on this bill tonight. Like, March 17th is St. Patrick's Day. So for all of us Irish here, I mean, if we put this on St. Joseph's Day, I'm pretty sure you'd have Jean Valicente and Mayors Policina and Lombardi knocking down on our door and being like, what are you doing there? Um, so I, I really would like to understand why they chose March 17th. Um, it's St. Patrick's Day, like at the yeah, end of the day, you. whatnot. Thank you for that question. I was told the reason that they looked at March 17th is because if a municipality had wanted to have some type of a parade that there's a, a number of our first responders who participate in St. Patrick's Day parades anyway, and it's rather costly to get the uniforms cleaned and pressed and so forth, and they thought that that would be, you know, that would make the most sense. Uh, another date that had originally been suggested by the committee who first heard it was September 11th, but uh, again, September 11th is a day to commemorate and, and honor those victims, as well as the families who lost people in, in the uh, attack on September 11th. So, you know, I wasn't real crazy about doing that as a date. I agree with you, and I will tell you that I've had some people from the general public reach out to me and say that they felt not only is St. Patrick's Day, St. Patrick's Day, but it's a, a religious holiday because it's named for a, state, a saint, and they didn't think that that was appropriate, which is why I'm telling you I'm not hot around with regards to the date. I'd it, like to have a date that's appropriate. I still think that October 28th makes sense because then we would be in line with the federal calendar. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, I, growing up on Aquinnick Island, we had the police parade, I believe, it was like the first week of, week of May, if I remember correctly. And 9-11, I agree with you. My uncle was a firefighter for 9-11, and I, I respect it. It's a, it's a very different day, per se, um, although still very much on the first responder. I would love to, and if they're not going to call in tonight, just have an offline conversation with the police chiefs and fire chiefs. Um, like you said, St. Patrick's Day for so many Irish, Irish Catholics in particular, this is a rather sacred holiday, um, even though not, not tremendously official, per se, as far as a day off, but um, it's definitely something that has been born and bred in our culture here. So um, while I, I'd love to support a first responders day, I would like to try to get it off um, St. Patty's if we could. Thank you so much. Happy to work with you on that. Thank you. Uh, are there any other responses? I have to say that I concur, being Kathleen Riley Fogarty, that St. Patrick's Day did, so I, I'm like, I might forget to celebrate the, the first responders that day. I'll be busy, you know, saying my prayers to St. Patrick. So, uh, all right, there's no more questions. There is a call on the phone. This is uh, Randall Rose, and he is Khan. So we will uh, talk to Mr. Rose right now. Mr. Rose. Hello, Mr. Rose? Yes. Okay. You're here to testify at uh, Special Legislation Committee for on House Bill 5592. Yes. Um, so, this, um, as has been mentioned, this bill is um, um, setting aside St. Patrick's Day to honor police and firefighters. We already have some holidays in state, we already have some days to commemorate police and firefighters in state law. In fact, um, the um, we have a um, law that already sets aside September 11th, interestingly enough, as um, the um, 
um, we have a date, uh, law um, 25.212, uh, sorry, we have a law tw um, um, that um, sets aside September 11th as the date to honor police and firefighters. Um, that's 25.248. Um, so there's already a date to honor members of these professions in state law. Um, plus, we have another law that's um, set aside um, the, um, the um, middle of May as National Police Week. Um, so there are um, dates to honor the, um, <laughs> these first responders. Um, like other people, I don't think St. Patrick's Day is appropriate. People have given many good reasons why it's not an appropriate day. Um, and another reason is that um, there are concerns um, about um, the um, issues between police and um, people of color. Um, the um, Gallup poll last year said that um, said that um, 71 percent of black Americans know some or a lot of people who are treated unfairly by police. Um, I don't think, um, given those concerns and given that we're in the middle of the um, George Floyd trial that's just starting now, um, I don't think it's a good idea to honor um, police <laughs> on a day that's um, associated with Irish people. Um, it's, um, it feels the visit to associate police with one particular ethnic group um, holiday. So that's another reason among the many other reasons why September, why uh, March 17th is not the best day. Um, so I, um, I think we already have enough ho um, holidays to commemorate po um, police and firefighters. Um, and it's, um, and certainly, um, police um, do a lot of good things. Um, so, um, some police live up to the um, praise that's given to police in this bill, um, but there are also concerns about police, so honoring police on St. Patrick's Day is probably the wrong choice. Um, so for those reasons, I'm opposed to the bill as it stands. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Are there any questions for Mr. Rose? Hearing none, um, I will now close the hearing on House Bill 5592. Next, we will Thank take... You. Thank you. Next, we will have House Bill 5594 by Representative Lima. This is an act relating to holidays and days of special observance, and it sets aside the 27th day of October annually to be known as Dr. Ernest Finocchio Day. I don't know if uh, Representative Lima is here to talk about. I don't think she's here. I don't think she's, uh, I don't think she's here either, but I think this is to uh, commemorate the um, the, the, vet, the state veterinarian, yes, um, as a, an honor and recognizes passion and dedication and contributions to anim, animal welfare and advocacy in our state. Um, I know he was, he's a well-known, um, he's been here testifying many, many times over the years. Um, so I don't know if anybody has any questions about House Bill 5594. Try to glad to answer them. Hearing none, I will then now close the hearing on House Bill 5594. And then last but not least is uh, this Representative Fogarty has some bill in here, so we'll, we'll do her last. This is House Bill 5593. Uh, this is an act relating to the General Assembly on Holly Landing. It renames the landing in South Kingstown known as Warden Pond Landing to Holly Landing. The family of a Leonard Holly and Arthur Holly would like this to be named um, after the two gentlemen, or the two brothers who dedicated the land um, that's as part of Warden's Pond and Al Alewife Brook. Um, they sold it to the town of South Kingstown for $10 back in 1953. They started it and was signed in 1954, June 22nd of 1954. This is long overdue. The family has been asking for a while for this to pass. And I hope that the last remaining member of the family who remembers this happening um, wants to see this happen. And uh, I'd like to try to move this through just to name this after the family who donated this land for $10 to the town of South Kingstown. So uh, with that, anybody have any questions for Representative Fogarty? No? Hearing none, I will close the hearing on House Bill 5593. And with that, I think we've finished our agenda. And so I will ask for the meeting to adjourn. Motion to, Motion to adjourn. Seconded by everybody here. Thank you very much. That concludes House Committee on Special Legislation for Monday, March 8th.